the start of me starting to move into Liverpool, starting to meet people there, and obviously being a a clubber, I started to meet people in Liverpool. You know, went to Quadrant Park. I like, met met James Barton. You know, Kip, the most key. Who people, you know, Andy Carroll was his partner at the time, and you know, James was doing things from. I knew his history in Liverpool. I was still, I had no experience of doing parties, but you know, got buddy with James. James was doing a few things. He did Quadrant Park and was doing the 051 Club. The 051 Club has set itself up as a, I guess, a Liverpool version of the Hacienda. Never was that. It wasn't going to be that. I decided to do two parties, birthday parties for my girlfriend and one of her friends. Six months before, I approached James to come out of the 051 really and do a night ourselves those two parties were important because we were both in the small room at what became Cream uh, at Wastonham Square the, an- the annex and that's when it, the seed was sown that's when me and James started to think about and talk about what would it could be start something there I guess I convinced him I guess he had more to lose than me he was you know earning good money doing well at the 051 and anyway, cut a long story short, I nagged him for that long, but he, you know, we decided that we'd take a punt on it and did, you know, started cream. <laughs> no idea, obviously, at the time what it would go on to be, but it was just the right time, the right place, you know. There was a few partners involved at the beginning, very quickly, like Andy Carroll, a couple of other people that fell by the wayside, and I guess then myself and James kind of, you know, carried on together. I mean, it was a pretty popular party right from the beginning I mean how do you reflect back on those early years no oh, I just I could consider it as obviously a very uh important time of my life I always thought that each week from starting it in 1992 in October 92 that the following week will probably be the end you know from going from signing on 21 pound 50 a week to all of a sudden having a you know a significant for me then a significant amount of money you know, whether it be five hundred pounds, thousand pounds, whatever it was, we were pulling out each week. It was, it was one thing, and it took me, I guess, probably took me a good year before I had the confidence to know that this wasn't going to go away quickly. Not to the extent where it would mushroom to what it did, but yes, yeah, it was a special time. You know, to have had to have had the for it to have worked out the way it did. There was a lot of factors. You know, why it worked, and at the time, difficult to see that. Well, you're in the middle of it. But, you know, looking back, especially when I left Cream in 98, looking back at it, and then comparing that to home in London, which is what I'd left Cream to go and do. Well, we talked about that much, but, you know, the whole leaving Cream thing, it was always, always about the, how difficult it was personally. I mean, James, you know, quite an acrimonious split. It took us a long time to both get over that. You know, he was my best man at the wedding, he was my best friend. It was difficult, very difficult. But, the you know, the... The truth is, you know, I would, behind the scenes for about a year, I was trying to convince James that what was going to go on in London with a, a guy called Ron McCulloch, who was behind the home thing, should be a cream. You know, we should do that together with cream. James never wanted to do that. And ultimately, I decided it would, you know, I had to go and try it myself. So, yeah, you know, all I can remember from the cream days outside of the very end is just how lucky we both were to have, Started something that became what it did, off the back of nothing, you know, off the back of a off a mash box, you know, and yeah, difficult to remember what you learn in those times. We kind of react into the what was going on, like a I don't know, like a sandstorm or something. But yeah, looking back on it now, you just I mean, overall I, I consider myself as very very lucky to have had that at that time. I mean, what were those key factors that made it such a success? I don't think cream could have become cream. If the Hacienda was in full flight, if I'm truthful with you, we'd, you know, we'd never set up to, to try and compete with that. And it would have been impossible. By the time we had opened up the club in 92, October 92, the Hacienda was not the Hacienda anymore then anyway. It was open still. But I guess James had had, you know, from a young age, was always a bit of a lad, tickets out, putting on parties, managing you know, magic managing a, a couple of bands, K class, enjoyed book gigs on. So he was a kind of, you know, Jack the Lad, local, kind of local hero, I guess. His family were, you know, the Bartons are a big family in Liverpool, you know, there's like, there's a lot of love for them, just salt of the earth, gorgeous people. 
And I guess for me, outside of coming in, stu- ex student, I guess a lunatic in a way, you know, kind of <laughs> like w- w- worked solidly, you know, like non stop. So people tell me now, anyway, looking back at that. I don't know what they mean, but I don't kind of know what they mean. I guess coming from a non Liverpool student, arty kind of, but, but that's where my if my friends were in Liverpool anyway, my girlfriend and her pals. Those two things coming together really. The, the fact that we managed to put, I guess, scousers with an arty kind of college group of people together, and we kept it small from when we launched it up until for the next three or four months. The gel of those two, those two groups of people, I guess after had Hacienda had done, in the, when it's in its heyday, but this was the real key thing. That's what allowed it to bloom. And I guess if there would have been something, but like I say, if the Hacienda was still firing all cylinders, we probably wouldn't have enjoyed that success. Not in the same way, you know, because all of a sudden then it became a not not just a Liverpool event. Then, you know, we started to, you know, spend a lot of money in advertising you know, across the north, nationally, and, you know, and then it exploded, you know. That's when people were coming in on coach loads, like, big numbers. So, yeah. The union between J- what James and, I guess, his crew and me and my crew, really, had a safe environment without any, for a long time anyway, without any trouble whatsoever, and it's just, yeah. Liverpool was due, I guess, a success, I guess, you know. The, the, you know, the che, ten years later, five years, even ten years later, Liverpool was unrecognisable to me. When I'd left in '98, going back a few years later, it's like, God, we didn't have any of this when we started cream, and all of a sudden now it's like Liverpool won everything, the whole thing, you know, city of culture, all of that. The fact that we didn't have all that beginning, I think, was part of the, part of the reason why it was a bit of a jewel in the crown, I guess, you know, kind of thing, or yeah, maybe an oasis in the desert. Maybe it was a better description. <laughs> so yeah, you left cream in 1998 to start home, and you. You started home in Sydney, and then in London, Ibiza, and then also Homelands Festival. You must have been very busy around that time. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess so. You know, I guess we, when I left in '98, we had just completed the first the first cream fields. You know, and that was just that was that with the mean for the year. So by the time I, you know, I left a month later, the relationship. With the Moon Fiddler, they kind of stayed with me because one of the people who were involved with the Moon Fiddler and the Home Home London project was a guy called John Reynolds. So I'd naturally aligned myself with John through going to work with Ron. So cut a long story short, you know, we'd we'd already then we'd be leaving. We'd already forward planning. Home London was going to open in October '99, but we'd already done a summer then leading up to them with Home and Space. So we'd operated. A summer at space, which was ace, which was, you know, from the beginning was brilliant, lucky, whatever, the right time, place again, whether it was called home at space or not. And home Sydney had also opened up before home London. So the home London was the last thing to land. 12 months later, then we were on with doing home lands, you know. The festival with the main filler, which we'd obviously not, we kept the site down south in Winchester, which is the site of the first cream fields. And then, you know, the rest is really James had carried on with cream fields, moved it up north. Logically, but yeah, you know, at that time, Mark and Sarah, my ex partners at, at Space, you know, we love at Space, were already in, you know, in line with me. They'd been running Cream at Amnesia up until that point, so they joined me. Then went to Sydney, as it happened for a few years, and then we pulled them back out of Sydney. Sydney was, you know, the whole what we were getting up to then, all of it except for her London was brilliant. Alas, Home London was such a disaster financially for Ron, Ron and his, his partner that he ended up bringing the whole thing down two years later. You know, his whole business, not just Home London, but their whole business, which was like 30, 35 operations in Scotland and everywhere else. So, yeah, we were busy. I remember, you know, the, me, Mark and Sarah plotted up in, in London in a little office. Like, as soon as we would get Home London bedded and completed... One week later, we're all out here, like in a, in a two-week period, we're opening up space, like Hermit Space, then we love space. So, yeah, we uh, we just got away with it by the skin of our teeth, it felt, you know. For those that don't know, Home London was a kind of seven-storey nightclub in the heart of uh, London's West End, number one. Leicester Square. Num- Sorry. Number one Leicester Square. <laughs> yeah. um, it's an amazing address. I mean, Indeed. 
it seems like an incredible place to have a, a club of that size. I mean, why didn't it work? <laughs> Looking back at it, me trying to talk James Barton while I was at Cream into joining Ron McCulloch with his plan to then, which would have meant obviously of diluting what Cream was, diluting what our ownership of it, maybe becoming equal partners or whatever. James made the right decision. Ultimately, I was too blinded. But there's a lot of other reasons why I wanted it to happen. You know, James wasn't in Liverpool a lot at that time. He was running deconstruction, well, Ted of A&R deconstruction records. And, you know, there was a lot of infighting between him and the venue leaseholder in Liverpool, loads of bullshit. You know, a lot of that was going on. But I tried hard and hard and hard to persuade James for us to do this. But it, enough was enough. I wanted, you know, I wanted to give it a go. I knew that I needed to do it. It never occurred to me, I guess because it was such a wrench to come out of cream, I guess I never looked at the... Uh, the. No one did, to be fair. You know, It wasn't until I'd left, I'd gone in and the door opened, if I'm truthful with you, a year later, that I realised that we were up against it. You know, less one less risk were 12, £13 million investment from Rom and his company in a seven-storey, four-tiered club, private members bar on the fifth floor, restaurants on the sixth floor... You know, it was on paper, and because of its, I guess its design and its ether, you know, and Ron had put his money where his mouth was, where with things that I wanted to do in a club, with the sound system that I wanted, and in all truth, it sounds ridiculous now, especially you, you all know more than me about London, you know. It, to have not really considered what we were going into, me as a, I guess a promoter, but if I'm truthful with you, Ron has the person behind it you know from the very beginning it, it's all you know in the background not i wasn't aware of it but slowly but surely it became so obvious that westminster council and and westminster police force were so dead against it and ron r- roughshod off over all of it continuously and it was i guess it was doomed to fail before it opened and i guess i was so not close to the middle of it because of me, but whatever factors me leaving me, my head being in, I guess just concentrating on what I was bringing to the table. In retrospect, people must have thought we were mad. Alas, it was never given. The outside of it being in Leicester Square, if the authorities would not set against it from the beginning, maybe it would have had more of a chance. Maybe, but looking back, yeah, I guess most people would say, "How, how was that ever going to work?" You know, without getting into detail I think the reason why the venue was closed down the reason it was given by Westminster you know Westminster Council and Police Force were it was overrun with drugs it's the opposite because it was never it was never going to be allowed to become that type of place ironically the best thing about Home London for me was fabric because every week I would dive out of home I'd be in fabric by ten past two. We had a two to close at two o'clock every week on a Saturday. I would be in fabric by ten past quarter past two, having a time of my life for you know the whole time I was there, and I learnt more by enjoying myself at fabric. I guess for me personally than what I ever did. Okay, the failing at home was a big learning curve for me too, but fabric was awesome. To have been a part of fabric was almost worth failing at home. Seriously, it was. It was like it was awesome. You know. <laughs> so home was finishing at 2am yeah Saturday night at 2am absolutely you know we tried to get 3 o'clock 4 o'clock now and again maybe every other month they managed to get a 3 or 4 o'clock extension but it was always people going to stay late in clubs if it's got all of the ingredients that make you want to stay in a club later and, you know compared to what we were doing we launched at the same time as Fabric almost exactly at the same time and it's it just the diametric opposite really of what was right and what was wrong, you know. So, yeah, everything was set against it. But thank God for the fabric and Keith Riley. <laughs> you switched your attention to Ibiza. Um, had you spent a lot of time there beforehand? Yeah, me, uh, me and James came out with him all respective girlfriends at the time in 1990. We came out again in 91. Obviously, we become friends at that point. I started to do a bit of work for him back in the pub, but our... Oh, a B3 experience was with those two first summers we were staying over in San Antonio and you know we've gone to a few venues here having a lovely time by the time Cream opened a year later so we opened October 92 by the summer 93 we did two parties with Jose Padilla at 
Pasha and two Athroposes at Space. That was our first experience here, putting on parties, I guess. One of those two parties at Space was... Quite, I saw it, I've told it a few times, but it's funny anyway. I'll, I'll recount it again now. Chemical Brothers, Tom and Edward, were DJ for me on the terrace. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm at Pike's Hotel. Didn't even get to there. After Pasha, I went back there. Got a phone call off Jim King, you know, close to me and James, working with us at Cream. He said, Daz, you never guess what? Pepe's just come over to Tom and I kicked him off and, and told him it was terrible and put David Morales on. I'm like, oh. It took me 15 years to get Tom and Ed back here after that. <laughs> Seriously, he did. So, but, you know, that's how green we were as well, you know. It's like, but, yeah, it started then, you know, the following year we did, a, you know, the following two years, we did eight parties in 94 coup before it changed to privilege the following year. And then we did a season as privilege there. And then we made the move to Amnesia. Cream was 96, we were in there then. And obviously that was a big part of our summer. By that stage, it's still heavily student influenced Liverpool, like most cities are, you know, even now, I guess, you know, where clubbing's concerned. And yeah, it was an extension of what we were doing in Liverpool, you know, really, I guess we were part of that roller coaster of British club promoters coming to a booth, uh, filling up their summer, and then by the time you've finished, you're going back, all the students are back, and then you're off again, end of September onwards. So it felt like a natural progression for us, you know, it kind of filled out our year perfectly. Musically, Cream was known for its, by the end especially, and looking at the party now and Amnesia, known for its trance, known for yeah. its big EDM these days as well. But We Love has never gone down that route. No. Musically, were you more inclined towards... The kind of more underground house and techno? Yeah, it's difficult. To, I don't want to... Cream, for me, by the beginning of 1997, not Cream, me, with it, I guess, yeah, James was still influential on in terms of what the lineup and what we were doing, what we put together, but I guess it was me at the forefront of it. I can only blame myself, I guess, because at that point, OK... The significant residency at that time with Paul Oakenfall was a commercial trance-ish sound then. It still worked. It still fitted. Cream. It didn't feel wrong. It felt felt brilliant in a lot of ways. However, you know, it, it kind of that was the no disrespect to Paul, far from it. And you know, or what we were doing at Cream, but it was. I already felt that. We turned a curve or hit the curve at Cream by that point, and that we needed to do one thing that would cover that type of the market, the more commercial end of the market anyway, with one person in one room that was at least the best of all of that, as opposed to getting into what I started to feel was the case, booking artists more for bums on seats than, than for the right reason. You know, I could talk about some of the names. It was far too many times when I was booking people like Jeremy Healy or Boy George or John, please, but me know that end of the market, not for the right reasons. Anyway, not totally. So, yeah, I guess, I guess that was my lean towards it. But I knew then at that point that we needed to change something. That needed to happen because I didn't want, I didn't want it to have to go down that road, and it was already feeling uncomfortable. And I'd be the person, I guess, who would. I guess because I was pro, the, you know, the main programmer that would get it was feeling uncomfortable with me, so it was always a matter of time really before something had to change, you know, and that's why I was pushing for London as well with James. We need, I wanted something else to happen. I didn't want to start to be just a, another club. Well, I guess when I'd left by '98, it was giving me an opportunity, you know, home London. We had Paul as a key resident. We tried it there too. You know, wasn't wasn't the same thing, and I guess the writing was on the wall for me. The opportunity was with space. The fact that we were doing Homelands by that point, Sydney two, home Sydney, but definitely between space, home in space, and we love space and Homelands. It was the opportunity to get to, to not go down a road that didn't feel right with me or comfortable. You know, it was the obvious way, I guess, for Cream to go. And I don't, it's not really my. It's not right really for me to talk about what Cream then went on to do. They did what they had to do. You know, they've been Liverpool, they they worked they, they aligned themselves strongly with Bugged Out. Bugged Out was somebody that I'd always tried to get in there, the pals of mine back from being in my uni in Manchester, you know, go to go to Justin Robertson's night, uh, most excellent was was a big part of my I guess 
upbringing in Manchester. So that was, I guess, Cream's way of filling some of the gap that I'd left. But most of that gap meant going down a more commercial route, I guess. And Trance, whatever, I'd say EDM. EDM wasn't around at that point. I hate that term anyway. Don't even know what it means. It sounds a bit naff, but there's only two types of music, good and bad. And I guess by the time that I was starting to make my way out of Cream, it was tipping over to, for me anyway, too much the other way. And I don't really want to sound disrespectful to Cream in any way. You know, but to be fair, Cream's probably been a lot more successful without me than when I was there, generally, nationally, internationally. And I don't think you can be that successful without being closer to the middle ground, you know. But when you found yourself at Space booking more house and techno, you, you felt comfortable again? Oh, yeah, I did, yeah, absolutely. The festival was important in the UK with Space for me because it allowed us to try different things out. We allowed, you know, we could do a lot of other, work with a lot of other genres, whether it was like straight out and out indie rock bands, whatever, main stage two, working with, say, Leo at the end, you know, movements, there was a lot... Like the work with Giles Peterson presented stages, Radio One on a book commercial tip. It was like it did us a lot of favours. That was a real big string to our bow here, and we benefited that. Maybe not clearly to everybody, but there was a lot of benefit. The relationships we were ha- having in the UK still, even though it was out of cream, home loans allowed us to continue. But space specifically, you know, the first two years, okay, let's say two, the year 2000. We had 16 shows. There was Sasha did seven. Carl Cox did eight. Danny Tanaglia did seven. Long Hardy did six. It was like, you know, and the things on the around of that was it was just like, it felt like it was another cream for me. It was I couldn't believe it was happening again, and I still can't believe it happened again. And nobody deserved to have two of those, and I did. You know, it was not down to me, down to the circumstances, just the right. It, it just worked and it, it was all of a sudden it was so what it was it was open again for us to do not exactly what we wanted but I guess yeah without pressure and it just it was a wonderful time those first few years you know to have found another one to again like I say be as I felt very like double double blessed double lucky to have a cream the way it was and then what looked as if it was going to be another another blessing you know you mentioned all those names there who obviously were stars then but have gone on to become real superstars. But 1999 was a big year on the island. Circle Loco, Cocoon, We Love. Yeah, yeah. It, it started these parties that weren't solely about the superstar DJ. Exactly. They yeah, were, they were they totally. Were, they were people led. and Yeah, I mean, you know, you said, I guess they were superstars then, but I don't know if you really compare it, you know, fast forward to 2015, your idea of a superstar DJ, you'd got the big, the the big boys on the island now and you know I guess Carl is the one not like everybody Carl Cos is a unique for me unique on the island you know it's like unique everywhere back then when we started say 2000 Carl Sasha Danny Laurent the four people I mentioned were probably there or thereabouts with each other in terms of profile whatever no disrespect to, to the other three but Carl took Ibiza by the throat I guess and nobody could have imagined that it would have what could have happened to him over the following years to where he is now it's just that was the way to do it so but Sasha was a part of it from the beginning when we did We Love It's When The Home Thing Failed in London Sasha was by 2001 Sasha got was quite significantly involved with me in the conversation so I was having with Space not as a partner but close so there was those relationships were strong me and Daddy at that time Tanagli was was strong as well, you know, it, and it was still a special time. And it almost felt like you could do no wrong in a way that was just the right time. There wasn't a lot, didn't feel as if there was a lot of, you'd have to push anybody and to, to, everyone wanted to be almost a part of it, you know. So, again, the superstars then is a different thing now. I guess if I think superstars now, I'm, I'm thinking more this, I'm going to have to say EDM thing, that you think of, you know, Avicii, Et al, whatever, that type of thing. And superstars with local dice want to be called himself a superstar. He is, but it's almost like a dirty word superstar, isn't it? <laughs> you know? But yeah, that, that, yeah, that's how I feel about that, you know? Yeah, we love found its niche with these incredible 22 hour events you'd run from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah. I mean, what was the atmosphere like at these events? 
the start, you know, in nineteen um the truth is, it took me a while to get my head round the idea. Danny, I mentioned Danny was like you know, Danny was you know with me at the time, we were, you know, partners, whatever you want to call it, Danny was was with me. I guess he had more of an idea of what it could be than I did. Of course, you know, I love space as a venue, but it was difficult for me to see how we could get from operation on a Sunday, a club that had been starting at 8 in the morning but really wrapped up by 4 or 5, maximum 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So for them to carry on, tell you what it felt like. The 22-hour thing felt like three parties in one. They wanted to continue to harness what was going on as an after party. That we'd been able to operate the inside of the space for people who didn't want to be on the tennis from first thing in the morning, but then also operate the what we'd seen the terrace, this you know halcyon outdoor lo-fi, I guess you know breakfast on the bar there kind of vibe. Not to ruin that, but just to make it a bit more serious, and then have trying to extend it into with the evenings. You have the terrace mainly focused evening, six, seven, eight o'clock in the evening till midnight. That was part two for it for us. And then from midnight onwards, the terrace closing, which was the case up until 2005, before the roof went on. Then we had the third kind of part of the show, which was a proper club. What to all intents and purposes, a club night that you knew people would be able to associate with, which was mainly based around the discotheque of the inside room. So, yeah, it was, it felt like three in one. You know, and we for for a few years we looked at it in that way. We'd have people promoting the mo- helping to promote the morning with us in terms of the inside. We worked for lots of different people. Rob Starr comes to mind, and Geddes, and he, there was you know, and Joe Upton were all quite important in the early years, helping us get this after thing. Put this way, no matter how young we might have been then, we were young enough to be able to do all of us to. to do a 22-hour thing week in, week out or so. We had to compartmentalise it, I guess. At the same time, also not trying to tie everything down and make it look like it was a three-tiered event by trying to keep it rolling, you know. And I guess it took... It probably took two two years of that for us to then to start to see it as one whole, you know. So by the time 2000 came, 2001, up to 2005, then... I see that, that the party was one party as opposed to a break, trying to break it down. And at that point, then it really started to roll, you know. We'd had Pepe, had st- Pepe Rizzo had started to get an understanding that this wasn't a blip, it wasn't going to be going away quickly. So therefore he was, you know, cr- critically, he was incentivized enough, you know, excited enough to be able to put money into the club to... To up the ante with it, what you know, sound system wise, decor wise, putting money where his mouth was, I guess, you know, which was critical because then, then we started to raise our game. And I guess, the, it, even though it's not for me to say, I guess, Circle Oka boys, the DC 10, Cocoon, Sven, all okay, might not be 22 hour party, but we're all different in our own ways. But I guess we all became, learned how to become serious. The relationships with the venue owners were critical for, obviously, for me and Space. I'm sure, you know, and Andrea Rubin and, and their, you know, the, the owner of, of DC10 and Martin Ferrer and, and Sven. The early years were important in getting this foundation. Of, I'm sure there was no great plan with those two parties either. I've talked about Andrea about it a few times over the years and it just... I was hardly aware, but I knew, of course, you know, DC 10 Circle Oak with Cocoon, but I wasn't, I was too busy to do my own thing to get totally, you know, understand what they they were up to. But I think it's interesting you talk about those three things. Quite nice as well for me, but we were all, it's a, I guess, a similar-ish journey. The relationship with the venue were critical, and I guess we all benefited from that in the long run, you know. So a 22-hour party, are you... <laughs> Are you on your feet the whole time? <laughs> My hell. Well, what the hell then? Um, <laughs> no, I'll tell you what used to happen. Sarah Broadbent was on her feet the whole time for long, for years. You know, she's like, she was like the proper, you know, proper <laughs> Trojan. Me and Mark would, you know, all the people around us would cherry pick, I guess, what we'd do. I, we'd go down in the morning, we'd be around, help Sarah, put rosters together, get the staffing, just, you know, I guess, brainstorm the operation for the day, put the foundations down, then we'd go 
go off at lunchtime, maybe 12, 1 o'clock, and get back to the venue for about 4 or 5 o'clock, and then we'll be in there then for the rest of the day. As every year passed, that got a bit, little bit more difficult to do. <laughs> but, yeah, it was a... Yeah, Sarah was the only one from our operation that was really, truly doing, living that blessing. <laughs> you brought a very diverse range of artists to the club and also some very adventurous bookings. Aphex Twin stands out, Grace Jones, the yeah. Chemical Brothers, of course. Yeah. I mean, are there any performances, any moments in particular that stand out? You know, just picking up on the one you just mentioned, Aphex Twin was something me and Mark had always discussed, but it was Mark's real dream booking, yes, you know, so... That's a Mark thing. He was, I'll try and answer it on behalf of him, talking to him about it yesterday as it happened up at Pikes for the him and Sarah's party with their babe. You know, we'd been asked for, to do a few interviews since I'd announced I was going out of space and Mark too, you know. Definitely one of his three highlights at the club. And AFX Twin was a dream for him. It was, you know, we got we just about got away with it, I'd say. Whom he would say, no, he would say more got away with it. It was like, but it was brilliant, you know, for me. Apex Twin was, you know, that's the spectrum, really. That's That really is, well, you know, for us anyway, it was a real coup. And the fact that Richard loved it, that it worked so well, and that Richard loved it, it wasn't expected un, unrealistic in what his expectations were going to be. I guess similar to Nicholas Jar when we did Nicholas Jar last year, it was a real big thing for me and Andrew. Andrew Livesey, Mark's brother, it was a big thing. And it wasn't a sensation in terms of the performance, but it kind of was because it worked enough. We were so nervous about about it not working for Nicholas Job. We so wanted it to work, you know. And it, you know, th th that was key too. And I guess similar to Apex Twin, you know, Grace Jones was again, you know, awesome, a bit of a dream gig for us. But I'll home in on that because at that time it, when Grace did it, she was she was the main the main person who the whole party was wrapped around, you know, the anniversary. But on the terrace at that point, uh, you know, and this is, again, the spectrum thing for me. On the terrace, up against her, who we thought was up against her, was David, was David Guetta. And, you know, he wanted to be played at the same time as her. And David was getting big then, but not what he then went on to become. 2008, yeah? It's like... It was unbelievable because the performance, the room that Grace was in, was like it transformed the club. It didn't feel like space, it didn't feel like anything that I'd been to in Ibiza. Maybe, you know, people said, oh, this is just some of the old heads in there on that. And this is how cool it used to be. This is your Grace Jones, blah, blah, blah. But for me, just as impressive and even more so was what David, what was going on in the other room when David Guess was on. It's like <laughs> there were more people on the tennis than what was in the disco. It was. This, you're not talking about David Guetta three, four, five years ago. It's like seven, eight years ago here. It was unbelievable. Okay, it was a very different thing, and the, you know the performance is a different thing. However, it was, I guess, a sign of things to come. We could get away with being as risky, and I guess is it risky, Grace Jones, but it's whatever that type of performance, a more of a, I guess, a cabaret thing than a club show, and in the opposite room. David Guetta was becoming, just about to become what David Guetta was to become afterwards, you know? The, the last year, with that was his last year with me. And the rest is history, so it, it was it was a special night, not just because of Grace Jones, but because of Grace Jones and David Guetta, who's always remained a really good pal. Him and his, his wife, you know, Cathy, they were delightful. So there's always a yin to the yang, you know, it's like, with Aphex Twin, the the things that we were doing on the tennis end with Paul, Paul Wolford was for me just as, just as important for me because he was at that time and place. Paul was he'd taken up the reins that Steve Lawler had had before him. I guess along with James Abila too. There'd always been to every big artist there was always a, a foil to that, and the tennis for me then was was my my room I guess you know so yeah. There's been some special times, you know, and, and, and you know, there's many, many, many more, obviously. And hopefully there'll be a few more to come in the future in Sagres, let's see. You mentioned in 2005 when they put the roof, they were forced to put the roof on the terrace. Essentially, the club was transformed from a daytime yeah. venue to a club nightclub, nightclub yeah. overnight. How did that affect the way you approach the party? So in 2005, obviously through the winter, the roof was being erected. It was supposed to be done for when we opened up our party but alas it, had, it hadn't been finished so we we operated four parties that year that summer without the room and 
I mean, ironically, the roof goes on the terrace. It's a month late, but what Pepe had done is opened up another, I guess, a watered down, no disrespect, but poor man's version of what the terrace was. We had no idea that that was going to happen until about two months before we were due to open. So, I guess why I mention that is the, the you know the key artist or the key resident that summer was on the terrace was Groove Armada. They were doing eight shows with us. The first three shows were on the Sunset Terrace. So by the time four shows in, we got the terrace, the old terrace with the roof open. <laughs> There was already quite a bit to try and juggle, trying to keep everybody happy before that actually opened. You know, from day one, of course it changed things, you know. We were, again, in the same way when we started at the beginning, 22 hours, we didn't have a, we didn't know how things would turn out, how it would work, 22 hour party. We, you know, we kind of went went with it and had to, had to react accordingly. And the same goes with the roof on the terrace, it was... It changed everything. We didn't know for sure that we'd be able to co- have the discotheque and the tennis running as, f- you know, a, a club, a proper club, whilst how that would work with the Sunset Tennis. It was, took a few years to get our head around it. Quite a lot of people have said, I don't know, naysayers have said that when the roof went on the space on the tennis, it was the start of the end. But that's, I mean, whatever, dramatic or gloomy. I might agree with them a little bit, but I wouldn't say not the same way. Start of the end, no start of a big change. What was before did change. It did change the feel of the club, but it was also awesome. You know, for years, maybe the next four or five years, that's where people wanted to play. Even, you know, just for the same reasons as what they used to want to play in the tennis beforehand. Because it was, you know, it was the way it was designed and the, the fact they could still let light in, etc. We still had the kind of feel of being outside. I guess like Amnesia's terrace had become too. At the same time, it was also allowed us to have a wicked sound system in it and operate it with air conditioning as a proper club room. And it was so it kind of had the best of both worlds, I guess, with it with that room. But you know, for sure, it changed things. Then it was the, it was the start, I guess, of other venues operating on the island, other people looking at maybe what space was doing, you know, not one too long before Amnesia's Terrace became what it is now. And that, you know, for me, if I'm sure it's the best room in Ibiza, anywhere, maybe not Club Night Circle, I would still say, but that, that room, you know, I think all serious clubbers, DJs, artists, whatever, would say the same. Ultimately, it's killer. And, you know, I guess it upped the ante, you know, then us, all the clubs started to put more money into, you know, the clubs that maybe hadn't done before. Passion had always done it, but Amnesia upped its ante for sure. I think that it kind of stepped everybody's game up. Obviously, you know, four, five years, six years later, Ushuaia opens and changes the landscape again, you know. But I guess it was just, for me, it was the start of it becoming a serious business, I guess, Abitha. That's what kind of summed it up for me. I mean, as a promoter on the island, you mentioned all those other clubs. I mean, how much are you keeping an eye on what everyone else is doing and competing? After the, the, again, it's many different answers to that, really. I remember more recently with Ushuaia opening, I remember being intrigued, I guess, by not just the venue itself and the operation, but the story behind it with Matutas and Pepe's relationship. And in the early years, it was possibly been discussed that it could the conversation was happening between the two of them that, you know, that Matusis were going to do this. Shwai was just a beach ball up the road and the Pepe and Matusis were talking. Pepe didn't go for it, for whatever reasons. And I remember being, I guess, intrigued by what I thought, you know, about the lad, but Avicii being up against us. It was like, okay, up against us, you know, for, for while they were opening. And, the you know, the impact of that was very interesting. It kind of sp- Proper shocked me, I guess, at the beginning. Um, I was expecting to see, I don't know, terrible thing to say. This I don't. It's not how I feel now, but I expected to see, I don't know, four or five thousand northern England kind of ravers, boys mostly. This anticipation, what I thought it might be, wasn't that. I, you know, I started to go there, have a look, look at Cushwire closer, I guess. But specifically of each night, and realised that this was not what I anticipated it to be. Again, a bit of a wake up call. 
whatever it was is not what I anticipated it to be. And all this, you know, for me being a bit green about that to starting to be intrigued, I guess, by it for a different reason, especially Avicii and his thing, as opposed to other things that were going on there, was interesting. And that is what, I guess it was iconic, really, but it was the start of a new a new thing in Avicii, you know, a new this EDM thing, whatever you want to call that. It truly landed at that point, and it was something that had space still, up opposite of Shwaya, in that area. It was important to start to comprehend it and understand it, I guess, you know. Because it's there, it's on the bus. It's not, you may not think there's competition or whatever, but you can't ignore what is going on there. It's, you know, it's changed the landscape. And as a promoter, I imagine there's a lot of behind the scenes goings on. I mean, do you think the politics are greater today than they were when you started? I think that the political arena is wider and bigger, more people involved in that, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it'd be very easy to get overly wrapped up in being negative about this, that, the other, you know, how things have changed, how Abitha right now is about is about the, the top end VIP, you know, crowd, how the effect it's having on Abitha, the, the becoming Americanized, I guess, become Miamiized almost, you know. For sure, whatever's happening now won't be the same in five years, seven years, eight years. My experience of Abitha is it, it's cyclic, you know, every... Whenever it is, there's no there's no law to it, but it goes through cycles, and whatever it is now won't be around forever, and things change. So, I guess I can't afford to get too wrapped up in, in the politics. I need to, especially now, if I'm truthful with you, that's what I guess that's bringing it back to sound because that's why I am comfortable where I am now, even though with the change and the impact, it, it, I guess you know that I'm having to get my head round and liking getting my head around it kind of feels about the right size and feel but right now the impact upon me with the political thing what's happening in Ibiza I feel better about where I am now and what I'm doing because it's it just feels more right for me now just right now anyway and I think for the next few years it'll be a good place for me to be follow the cycle and see where it's going in a bit more of a comfortable position I guess so is that the plan for the next two, three, four years? I've not gone into this like I didn't go into space with a, a start and an end thing. It's the people at Sankey's, I guess, Danny, David, that I'm keen on working with both this summer at Sankey's, what will happen after that with other projects, both here and in the UK and other places, other parts of the world. Uh, I'm committed to working with the people and it, Sankey's is important here, but it's not just Sankey's in Ibiza, you know. It's, it's what I'm putting all my effort into now, that's for sure. There are other things, other projects that I'm talking, you know, talking to David Danny about, which I'm excited about too, you know. You're keeping them under your hat for now? For now, yeah. I mean, you know, there's something in, in the UK that I'm interested in doing with David, but I can't really, I can't really say I don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. But you're still as passionate about promoting parties now as you were 25 years ago when you started <laughs> passionate maybe as athletic in terms of how I can f turn that passion into reality not as much it's important to have people it's important to have people around me that younger people to be honest that it's supposed to have the right people around you young and old but definitely younger for me you know Andy lives was important to the last couple of years He'll be getting involved with me too here very shortly. I need to know what I know and also but more importantly know what I don't know. What do you think have been your main strengths as a promoter over the years? I think knowing what I am and what I'm not, you know, what I'm not. What I'm not is a DJ. What I'm not is the best businessman in the world. What, you know, what I'm not is clear to me. What I am as a, whatever promoter means, I know, that is me, you know. There's quite a lot of conversations I have with DJs, for example, or agents of DJs. Especially now, everyone's a, a producer, everyone is a studio, or whatever. So, like, well, where's the DJs? You know what? For me, knowing who you are, what you're best at doing, I think is important, and I know that about myself. You know, under no illusions, I think that's the most important thing: is to not kid yourself. And what? Okay, every you should be allowed to try anything out, but for me, 